Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and I'm thrilled to welcome the famed value investor Guy Spear on the podcast today. Guy has been managing aquamarine funds since 1997 and it's achieved annualised returns of 9.5% over that period, compared with 8.1% for the S&P 500 and 3.6% for the FTSE 100. He wrote a brilliant book in 2014 called The Education of a Value Investor, which I've just read and warmly recommend it if you haven't. It's not very long and has wonderful insight into how his investment journey has evolved, drawing on what he's learned through personal relationships with several of the world's top investors. Some people will have heard of him because in 2008, he famously bid a whopping $650,000 along with Monish Pabrai to have lunch with Warren Buffett. Guy came top of his year in economics while studying PPE at Oxford University and later completed an MBA at Harvard Business School. He then had a pretty miserable time in investment banking before he started running the Aquamarine Fund in the late 1990s. In this podcast, we're going to discuss the current market... Guy's thoughts around a few specific companies and then speak more widely about how investors can improve their chances of success. For regular listeners, I'm afraid this is my last episode as host of this podcast. I'm sure the IC will find someone much more articulate than me to take my place, so the departure probably bodes well for the podcast, but I thought I'd let you know in case you end up wondering what's happened to me in the coming weeks. I'm fine, I'm just moving jobs. Anyway, Guy, thank you so much for joining us. How are things in Zurich today? Hi, Mary. It's a it's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, it's actually an honor even because I can tell the listener that Mary's done her homework. Uh, she wrote me an email this morning, which was extraordinary, and I've experienced different people interviewing me and reading my stuff, and it's a real pleasure to meet somebody who's who does her homework so well. Other than that, it's unbelievably hot in Zurich right now, and there's no air conditioning because some time ago, I believe the Swiss electorate took a vote that they weren't going to allow people to have air conditioning in old houses and so I've been not been sleeping very well and uh, but I did go for a bike ride this morning and look forward to a swim later today. Oh good well we've got some rain in London today which I think is quite quite welcome. Okay let's get going so to summarize your investment process your goal is to compound wealth at a high rate while minimizing the risk of permanent losses of capital. You run a global long-term value focused fund I know value is a slightly woolly term and looking at your p- portfolio, it might be considered quality style by many people's characterizations, but profitable, durable businesses that will compound forever. How optimistic are you feeling currently about your opportunity set? Because on the one hand, a focus on company durability and resilience has come back into fashion. On the other hand, the economic outlook feels very difficult for most equities. We're in a period of high inflation rising interest rates and low growth for many economies. You know, Mary, I've, I've been through uh, at least two or three periods of market swoons. And in the past periods, as you'll know from my book, I felt awful. And part of want, what I wanted the reader to know is if they think that it's just um, looks easy from people, for people in the hot seat, it's not. But I'm actually rather surprised because this time, I don't know how other fe- people are feeling. I'm feeling great about what I own. My only frustration is that I don't have more cash to put to work. And I look at my hero, Warren Buffett, who did have cash to put to work, and he's put about a third of it to work so far, as, as best I can tell, in the last three months, he's, he's invested 50 billion. So I feel very comfortable with the stocks that I own, but I'm just frustrated because, because the vehicle that I run doesn't doesn't generate cash internally for me to invest. The only way I get new cash is if people decide to send me some. Well, that's that's asked, answered my question about whether you've been buying things as Buffett has recently. You talked in your book about previous crises, and you had said to William Green at one point, "We're bleeding from every orifice." So I'm glad yeah. you're <laughs> glad you're not feeling like that now. <laughs> well, that was a. I, I will never forget when those words came around. So. I had written the book and it'd been accepted by the publisher, but I'd reached out to William, who's a friend, and I told him, look, if you can help me make this book better, I'll do anything, because unlike you, Mary, I don't write all that well. And so he actually found the time we spent about three months revising pretty much the whole book. And when we got to that chapter, he'd read it the night before, and he was far less kind to me than you might be. You might get inspired for him. He sits down with me 
at the wooden dining room table here in Zurich. And he says, you totally flubbed this chapter. I remember what you were like. You said, you called me up and you said, I'm bleeding for every orifice. I did not want to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, and actually I didn't want to put it in the book, but in, in a certain way, William gave me the courage to do that. So yeah, but I, I don't feel that way. And I don't feel that way because having been through other crises, so there's somebody that if you ever get to interview him, I'll send you, you'll, I'll, I'll congratulate you. He's based in London, uh, called Nick Sleep, and he talks about destination analysis. And William writes it up in his book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. And, you know, every time you make an investment, you kind of want to look at the very, very end of where it might end up and then roll it back to where you are today. And you want to see where the end point is. And every single company that I'm invested in, or pretty much every single one, I feel very clear about the end point. And I'll give you an easy example is railways. You know, railways, it's one network. As countries get more built up and uh, more infrastructure and housing and other things get built up, they get built up around the railway. So rights of way become more and more valuable. So you can kind of see an end point where the destination is pretty good. Or you have this company, Brookfield Asset Management, where Bruce Flatt talks about only wanting in, to invest in constrained downtown areas. And so you kind of, what's the destination? You know that the centers of cities are going to be desirable places to have real estate. And so you know the end point is good. And if you know the end point is good, who cares what kind of wiggles take place on the way there? And I've round tripped. Even in Berkshire Hathaway, I've round trip 50% declines and, and even greater declines. But if you know where the end point is and you're not reading from the current price into what your destination is, then you kind of feel better, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You said you don't have any cash to put to work. But one option would be to sell holdings that you own and put it into new stocks. Have you been throughout, even as valuations become more attractive in other companies, that the companies that you own are still the best ones? I, I, I cannot tell that for certain. I mean, one uh, sort of filter that you'd have to use is, is, is you know, comparing company A to company B, is it 5% cheaper than company B? Is it 10%, 50%, 90%? And I think that um, it, it becomes very, very hard to do that. Even if you give, do a threshold of saying, I believe that company A is 50% cheaper than company B. And there's this phenomenon that, the, when there's fear in the market, uh, you know, the, the person who acts out of fear, most, most of them don't realize they're acting out of fear. And I'd say that's the same for me because, because the brain is this very, very weird thing. And it ma manages to convince people like me that I'm acting rationally when actually I'm acting out of fear. So there's a whole layer of sort of, why would I be doing this? Is it, is it because I'm trying to be, is my... Is some part of my brain trying to convince me that I'm being smart in doing this, whereas actually I'm just acting out of fear? There's not to mention the fact that there's tr frictional costs. There may be taxes to pay if you if you switch from one holding to another. All sorts of costs just in the marketplace if you act. But then there's the whole psychological phenomenon, and I think that when I look at all of those things, and then I look at the other side, which is just to stay put, because you'll do pretty well staying put. That, so I have not been moved to do it this time. Having said that, 2020, I did do that. I sold, I, I felt like I was overweighted in, in Ferrari, which had done extraordinarily well for me. And I really did want to go into that period with more cash. So I went and I sold half my Ferrari and went and bought some other things with it. I'm going to come back to the psychology stuff later because I think that's so interesting. But before we do that, having read your book, I get the impression that you're focused on finding great companies rather than fussing over the macro factors, which are hard to predict and you don't have any control over. But as we know from this year and, and history, macro factors do affect stock prices and the discount rates used to value stocks when interest rates change. How much emphasis do you place on macro factors and how do you view the sensitivities of your portfolio to interest rates and inflation? I think that trying to use macro factors to predict when to buy into something or not is probably extraordinarily hard and not worth doing. And I think that many, many kind of investor letters that I get into my email inbox that talk about macro factors are kind of trying to either predict or explain 
the, the short-term wiggles. I can tell you that, just to give you a sense of how hard it is, I saw the Federal Reserve and other central banks' balance sheets explode in 2008-9. And immediately, because you know I had some economics training, I said, this must mean inflation. And it's taken 10 years for inflation to come along. 10 years. And even mm -hmm. now, we don't know exactly, is it because supply chain issues because of COVID? Is it because of the war in Ukraine and, and, and the natural resource prices are going up? Or is it the supply of money? Is it all three? You know, we know that in 20 years, economists will be able to explain it perfectly. But right now, we don't know. I think that, so that's not worth it. But to, to look at those, that, those macro conditions and say, well, what would happen if there's high inflation? And how do I want to be positioned if there's high inflation? I want to know that if I, the things that I'm invested in will do okay in high inflation, for example. Um, so to use it to drive your micro analysis or to, to drive company specific analysis is probably a good thing. You have to be aware of what environment you're in. No, I think that sounds, that sounds very sensible. In your book, you mentioned Nassim Taleb. To, to get on stock selection specifically. And one of the lessons from Fooled by Randomness is that life isn't linear and rewards continued effort to look in different places. The rewards are excessively big. How can you build a system so that you can get exposure to good ideas? I wondered maybe what inspired you to buy the Indian Energy Exchange and if that feeds into it. So first of all, Nassim Taleb's book, Ruled by Randomness, just blew me away. I think it blew a lot of people away. One of the, one of the takeaways I had never read anywhere else is this idea of extremistan and mediocristan. And some, some worlds are worlds in which people are random lottery winners and some worlds are not. And to understand what world you're in is, is really extraordinarily valuable in all sorts of ways. And, you know, uh, you happen to live in, in a particularly strong version of extremistan, which is London. Uh, and there are other places. I, Zurich is less of an extremist town, for sure. In terms of, uh, well, uh, why India Energy Exchange? So um, uh, an analogy that I've enjoyed using recently uh, is that I think of myself as a, as a um, hunter-gatherer caveman who's sitting in front of a cave. Uh, and, you know, um, and we need food to live. And dark, deep in the back of the cave, you've got these kind of like very safe, slow growers, but they, they're not, they're not going to go anywhere fast, but you're not going to lose them. Maybe like Berkshire Hathaway or uh, maybe even American Express or Nestle would be a great example. Then you can go out hunting for some really juicy stuff like mammoths outside the front of the cave. But outside the front of the cave, the further you get away, the more likely it is that you're going to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. So, you know, it's kind of dangerous out there. And if you sit at the front of the, you kind of want uh, a range of things. You want things deep in the back of the cave that if the world comes to an end, you can go and bury yourself there and live for a long time, but you can also go out hunting. So um, why India Energy Exchange? It, it's set certainly in front of the cave. It's something that it could be potentially dangerous, but could potentially give extraordinary returns. I started exposing myself. Well, I found India because I was interested in the credit rating business. And uh, I'd invested in this company, Duff & Phelps, uh, which was based in the United States. And I realized credit rating was an amazing business. And 20 years ago, I went in, to India because Krizzle was there, which is a kind of a leading rating agency. And then I, idiot, sold it <laughs> for all sorts of reasons. But that got me interested in India. And, and Monish, whom you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, was uh, a good friend. and so I've been back to India a number of times with him. And, you know, I mean, I've literally reviewed hundreds of companies in India, and I've been at conferences where you meet hundreds of companies. And India Energy Exchange just stood out. It stood out because I could see where the endpoint was. And the endpoint was not, it's not as likely an endpoint as with Nestle, but it's way up there and was an extraordinary business. And I knew that if I get myself exposed to that, having said that, it was India. So um, there are all sorts of unknown unknowns, Donald Rumsfeld would say. So, but you also, your question, kind of this idea of exposing yourself to new and different ideas is, is a wonderful question, because I do think that the people, there are many investors I know in the city of London who don't do that, and probably also in New York as well. And how do you get yourself exposed to new ideas? I mean, some investors in the city of London attend the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And that's a kind of a way because you get people from all over the world who come there. 
I went to India to expose myself to new ideas. Well, I, I probably make too many jumps like that. I probably could benefit from staying in one place. And even my attempt in Zurich to kind of live a more quiet life, as you will have gotten from my book, it's kind of like I left, I left New York to come to Zurich to live the quiet life. And then the, the kind of like a more busy, a more, more busyness kind of followed me to Zurich. So I kind of attracted it around me. So I've rambled a little bit, Mary, but maybe somewhere in there does not answer your question. I don't know. You said India has unknown unknowns. Another place that has a lot of unknowns for us over here is China. And you have quite a big holding in China. You've got a big position in BYD, Chinese electric car company, You've got a small holding in Alibaba. There are lots of investors that w might not touch China because of the influence of the Chinese Communist Party and regulations and worsening relationships with the West. How much confidence do you have in your Chinese holdings? So, you know, it's fun talking to somebody who's in the business of writing because the, the industry that creates stuff for us to read has to create stuff that we want to read. And right now, writing about that is something that will get eyeballs. So we're seeing far more stories about that. And obviously that doesn't answer the question because maybe it's, you know, is it the reader's fear and concern that's suddenly arisen now that makes a lot more uh, things appear in the press about it, or is it the genuine underlying reality? Of course, we we will never know. But I I come to kind of um, underlying basics, and there was this term that was used a lot in the U.S. What's good for GM, General Motors is good for the United States, and um, and so I I think that there is an enormous amount of concern, and I can't get rid of that concern about where will the Chinese Communist Party go? Where will Xi Jinping go? Uh, he kind of seems to be dictator for life. And the biggest concern is that our useless Western democracies, Western liberal democracies, have the capacity to reboot. And, you know, the, the most amazing reboot, we can talk about the reboot in Western Europe after World War II, but the reboot in the USA after the American Civil War is just an incredible reboot. I mean, they were killing each other. Americans were killing each other in the thousands. And so my biggest concern about China is what if they don't succeed in rebooting from a kind of a dead end? And it kind of happened to the Ming dynasty that they did not succeed in, in to reboot and the country went in decline. It was certainly China has gotten to a place where what is good for the world is good for China and what is good for China is good for the world. China is an enormous exporter. It's, 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 integrated into global supply chains in a most incredible way. It's the result of opening China to free trade. And so if you look to the rational interests of China, if China wants to continue to lift so many people out of poverty, they have to make decisions that are good for the world. And does that mean that they will? No, it's shocking to see what Russia's done because it just seems so unbelievably irrational. And we can't guarantee that China won't do something unbelievably irrational. But so so I can't I can't guarantee it. But I if you ask me what the balance of the probability is, more than the balance of the probabilities, is that the Chinese Communist Party, the decision making mechanisms within that will make decisions for China and for the world that increase prosperity all around and therefore BYD will do well. But, you know, it's, it's a kind of a hairy thing. You can't be sure. I would tell you that it, China is not my home base. I'd be very concerned. I wouldn't sleep very well at night if 80% of my personal net wealth or of my fund was dependent on outcomes in China. That's a really good answer. Thank you. And you're, you're really right about the media fueling the narrative and going for what people like to hear about. And, and people need to see through that and investors need to be. And, and you talk about it a bit in your research process about how you gather information, which, which we will come back to. <laughs> One, but the, just the last company I wanted to talk about was Twitter. It looks like you owned it and sold it. And I wondered if you sold it after the Musk bid and what attracted you to the company in the first place. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm feeling like it wasn't a very big position, but I'm feeling like a bit of a genius there. And you've got to take the feelings of being like feeling like a genius because because anybody who's an investor knows that the market will head had hand your head to you on a plate multiple times through a career. But uh, I bought Twitter. So 
we go into lockdown, my portfolio goes down, God knows by how much, and I don't own any, you know, Zoom, Peloton, all these companies that absolutely soared into the lockdown. And you know, I, I understood the software as service business model. I'd obviously been following companies like Facebook, and I just felt so frustrated that I hadn't participated in some way. And one of the blocks for me was that I refused to pay many multiples of revenues. So, you know, Snowflake at the time was trading at 100 times revenues. You know, I kind of was the kind of guy who liked to buy fiat trading at 0.2 times revenue. So there was a point at which fiat had 120 billion in sales and had a 4 billion market cap. That's more my kind of style. But I did some, I, I was talking, I, I could, I used Twitter. I'd understood I'd, that Twitter is an extraordinarily powerful network. And there's amazing stuff that one can do through Twitter. There's science Twitter. There are all sorts of really interesting conversations that take place across Twitter. If you if you tune out all the garbage and you really do have to tune that out and mute it. So I got the insight that Twitter was actually far more influential than its revenues would imply. And I said to myself, and I held my nose, I'm gonna see what it's like to own Twitter. And I paid around 10 times revenues for Twitter. So, you know, off the top of my head, it had about 3 billion, three and a half billion in revenues. And it had maybe one and a half billion in kind of free cash coming out of the business. And afterwards, I kind of realized there's huge technological debt. And I didn't like the fact that Jack Dorsey is just all over the place. I did like the fact that Silver Lake were there. In any case, I sized the position right. It doubled on me. I didn't pay attention. It then went back to the purchase price. I didn't pay attention. Then Elon Musk makes his bid. And he doesn't bid as much as the highest it got to when I owned it. But what blew me away was how quickly the company just accepted the bid. And they just said yes. And and I, I'm proud. I, I hope you'll believe me when I say that. I'm proud. I said, that's ridiculous. They didn't shop this. They didn't try and find a higher bidder. What about Microsoft? What about Facebook? What about Salesforce? What about Oracle? What about many companies for whom this would be a small acquisition and they would now control a highly, highly influential network? And my conclusion was that if they didn't shop it, that's because those other companies weren't interested. and if the bid fell through, then they'd be left, uh, you know, at the wedding with no clothes on because they'd clearly, you know, they clearly didn't have an alternate partner. So, and I kind of, I love Elon Musk. He's an amazing guy. He's a benefit and a credit to humanity. And he's going to take us into the next era. I'm grateful, but that doesn't mean I have to be invested with him. So I said, you know what, Elon, I love the fact that you're going to own Twitter, but I don't need to, f to follow this story to the very end. And I sold to somewhere in the 50s. I was kind of chagrined at the time because I think the offer was $54 and I sold around 52 and I thought, ah, oh, I missed those $2. <laughs> and then as it, as it did start falling apart and I, uh, th that just felt so good. <laughs> you know, I, I, look, Elon is an amazing guy technologically. I'm really um, uh, in awe of him. Who wouldn't be in awe of him? But I think that he's disrespecting the rules of the public markets. You cannot make an offer he, he declined to do the due diligence. He was offered the right to do due diligence. He didn't. And then he comes afterwards with this idea that actually there's so many fake accounts or whatever you call them. You can't do that. And I think the SEC ought to have a big problem with him. I hope I haven't made an enemy of Elon Musk. I probably have. This is scary. <laughs> I'll have the Elon Musk fans tearing me down. So. Well, we can recover it with my next question, saying that if there's one takeaway from your book, I think, it, I think you want it to be model your heroes. And in your case, it's not Elon Musk, but in many people's cases, it might be. But you speak of how sitting down and thinking, what would Buffett do really helped you in becoming the investor that you are? And on a deeper level, I liked how you observed that humans' ability to mimic is one of the most powerful ways we advance. But do you have any practical tips for our listeners on how people can model their heroes and perhaps guidance on navigating who's worth mimicking and who isn't? So there's a point at which you have to stop mimicking your heroes. Probably the point at which I was sitting at the annual meeting and every time Warren would eat uh, some um, uh, peanut brittle, I would eat some peanut brittle. And when he ordered the Diet Coke, I'd ordered it. That's too much. But, but it's okay to do that because because you really want to learn uh, as much as you can. Uh, first of all, for, for individual investors, I'd say that you have 
an enormous advantage, enormous. So, so just think that um, I, I have investors who are fearful and so they want to put their hands on money. And so I, I, the nature of my vehicle, even though there are lockups, uh, is that I have one eye over my shoulder because I know that investors might want to redeem. And as an individual investor, you don't have that. You have your own portfolio to run. And I just, you know, there are enormous advantages in that. And there are some investors who stop running money for other people because they want to have those advantages for themselves. So that's got nothing to do about heroes, I guess. But I think that the other thing that I would say is that, and this comes up for me repeatedly, is that there's this perception and, and there are certain kinds of professional investors who want to cultivate this perception that they're like fighter pilots in the airplane, carefully monitoring the instruments with a clear hand on the, on the, on the joystick, sort of precisely flying the plane to its correct destination. And I think it's a terrible model. And if you're an individual investor and you kind of, compare yourself to that you're going to have, feel self-doubt and you're going to feel like you're not doing a good job especially in a time like this and perhaps a better analogy is you know i've used the analogy of drunks and bars that mary if you ask me about i'll get into because i think it's a good a useful analogy but another analogy is gardening or growing a vineyard you plant a vine you leave it alone for 10 years you don't pull it out and look at the root structure and decide to plant a new vine in terms of, and, and then in terms of like modeling one's heroes, I think that what's really, really important if, you, if you're using it for investing is, and, and, and I don't know how much business biography you've read, Mary, and it was a, a part of a motivation for me for the book is that there is so much that gets un, left unsaid in these business biographies. Be aware that so many successful people cultivate a public image that is not actually what their life is like in reality. So if you're modeling somebody that you haven't met, that you know, be careful and be aware, don't model their public image because that probably doesn't reflect reality in the slightest. And then, you know, understand where your, your journeys have to part. I mean, you know, you, you model Warren Buffett. So my, my journey with Warren Buffett is that I, I was in love with him. I did everything like him. All I could think about was Warren Buffett. What would Warren Buffett do? Then I started hating him for a while. Because, because I was like, I'm never going to reach that. I'm never going to be as good as that. So I hate you. <laughs> and then you, so you kind of like then have to diverge and become a best version of yourself rather than trying to be the other person that you'll never succeed at being. No, that's very true. And the, the not reflecting reality is very true as well. And I mean, that applies to lots of different areas, including survivorship bias and funds, which you have to be aware of. It's absolutely extraordinary. It's beyond extraordinary what, what happens there. And actually, Mary, if all, if all you ever do, which you're going to do way more than this, but if all you do is educate readers on survivorship bias and how it manipulates them into thinking about funds and where to invest, that would be an extraordinary service. But I, I think you know, new investors don't realize it. They don't realize they're looking at survivorship bias. You know, they think that that's the record and they wonder why they didn't get that. And there's a, I don't know, you didn't study mathematics, but I got, <laughs> so there's somebody in London called Ole Peters who uh, talks about a concept called ergodicity. And uh, the bottom line is um, you, you often cannot compare yourself to the ideal path because that ideal path is one that is selected out of millions. And if you would have had anything other than that ideal path, you would not have done as well. So theoretically, you take that path, you could do well, but I'm not going to try and get into it right now. But look up Ole Peters and ergodicity. The bottom line is if we had the perfect world for retail investors, we would not allow that survivorship bias uh, to appear because it misleads them. Well, I promised that I would get back to the psychological stuff earlier. So you mentioned in the book that you think that your advantage is your realisation that you have a flawed brain. And you say it took you a while to learn that the shiny economic theories you had learned at university don't tell you much about how the world really works. And you talk about how we all have mental shortcomings, but that we all have different mental shortcomings. So how can people go about understanding what their own mental shortcomings are and then build workarounds? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> that's the big question. I think that, um, first of all, just to, to merely be 
to, to understand that distinction, to say, my brain doesn't work well. And my job, there's a kind of, uh, you know, in a certain way that perhaps there's multiple uh, CPUs in the brain or multiple parts of the brain. And there's a part of the brain that needs to manage the brain. I am not my brain. I, I am something else. Or another, another analogy that I love to use with my children, actually, is, um, you know, I, I'll tell my child, you have a great engine in there, but you still haven't worked out how to use the gearbox. And if you don't use the gearbox and every gearbox is different, um, you, you, you will not translate all that horsepower into, onto the road, if you like. So just having that distinction, because then it becomes uh, in a certain way, quite difficult, but it's difficult because that's the reality, which is I'm experiencing something. I'm experiencing an insight. I'm experiencing an idea. Is this reflective of the reality out there? Or is this reflective of some weird interaction between, um, me and my brain? And I think that the, the, the short answer to your very difficult question actually is you just need to be self-reflective and self-aware and engage in any and all activities that expand your capacity to do that, which, you know, it includes meditation, but might include psychotherapy, reading books on psychology, developing lists of mental shortcomings that we all have, reading books like Danny Kahneman's Fast and Slow, are all ways to kind of try and understand this weird contraption that our brain is. And, you know, our brain it didn't evolve for, for a modern economy. It evolved as we, most of the time our brains evolved was to be a hunter gatherer. So we're really good at all the kinds of things that you would need to be able to do as a hunter gatherer. But there are, there are ways in which a modern economy operates that go 100% counter to way, the way our brains are, have evolved to work. And I, I think that the only answer is to kind of study that stuff and to be interested in it and to collect it. I mean, you know, I, I think that you can't repeat this story enough And somebody who's new into investing, just to use the hunter-gatherer analogy. So the hunter-gatherer goes and eats the berries and feels sick. And so does not eat those berries because they made him feel sick or they tasted bitter or they gave him so... And when he finds the tree or the area of berries with, that make him feel good, he continues or she continues to eat those berries. That is a that is very deeply wired into us. And what we have with investing is that we buy shares in the company, it goes down, we don't feel very good. Uh, and so we want to buy less. It's kind of like the berries, but it's actually the opposite. If you've bought a business that has a good destination, the more the price goes down, the better it is. So it's fundamentally just the awareness that so we have to overcome our wiring and and the same in investing just to bring it back to investing mary we have this wiring we have to become aware of it and we have to overcome it and and we just have to study and learn i guess that's my best another thing that we is deep wiring for us which you talk very well about i think is envy and the challenges challenges and opportunities that come with it and you talk about how being around very rich or very successful people can be destabilizing and lead to bad decision making. And I liked this because it's different from just getting away from the noise that we hear a lot in terms of why you might want to live away from the hustle and bustle of somewhere like New York or London. And you also talk about how willpower is a limited force. Yeah. So not, not many of our listeners will be working on Wall Street I don't think. But social media is also really bad for people bragging about stock performance, fear of missing out, something that we've all felt. And those who bought at the top of the bubbles will realise how damaging it can be in the bad decision makings. So do you have any guidance on how to control these feelings? Yeah, I mean, one thing is if you bought because of FOMO or you bought at the top of something and you feel like you've messed up, one, of the, one thing that I really urge any listener to do is be kind to yourself be kind. You're actually, you're dealing yourself a double defeat if you're not kind to yourself. So understand that you're human and, and forgive yourself for being human. It's okay. It's all right. You know what? You're still alive. You're still living possibly in the United Kingdom where, as, as Monish said, in, in the United States, in the UK, if, you know, nobody starves. I, you know, and I'm not saying that that's great, but, but so the last thing you want to do, and I think this is true probably in, in so many places, is if you allow the mental uh, regret of having made a mistake to take you down, you're actually handing yourself a double defeat and you shouldn't do that. Take care of yourself, make a resolution to learn the lessons, 
uh, go read Danny Kahneman or go go decide to educate yourself on investor psychology so that you don't make those mistakes again, but don't just um, double down on feeling bad about your, about it. I think I, I really do believe this. I think that I've written this elsewhere. First of all, I think it's totally fine. I, I kind of surprise people every now and then when I tell people oh, I was really envious of this person or that person, because I think that when we confess to emotions are a guide to action, are a guide to what's really going on. And when we feel envy, it's a guide that we have to take action to change something. So, so I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. If we just sit paralyzed by our envy and it grinds us up, then, then that's a terrible thing or any kind of strong emotion. But if, we, if, if I think if you experience envy on social media and say, what is this saying to me? What do I need to do? What action do I need to take? It might be to shut down your social media accounts. It might be to move to a less extremist part of the world and ask yourself, is my, am I making progress? Is this is getting me to somewhere? Our emotions are deeply wired into us. Our emotions are not just these things that sort of sit around us and influence us. Our emotions are telling something, us something. The emotions that the hunter-gatherer felt are what led him to the berries, led him to the mammoth that he slayed. What, you know, th those emotions are guides to action. We just, in the modern world, often the emotions we feel don't lead us down the most productive path. So we have to engage all of our sort of like developmental apparatus to guide us in the right direction. So I could ramble all over the place, Mary. No, it's really profound. We're going to we're gonna record another podcast together one day and it's going to be at least two hours long. So <laughs> I won't be rushing you through it. So yeah. you have strict investment rules that you follow and some of the types of things that we hear a cohort of fund managers say fairly often. So don't check the stock price incessantly. Don't talk to management, stay objective. Don't buy or sell when the market is open to make sure you give yourself time, have a checklist. One I hadn't come across before, which I thought was very interesting, was make sure you do your research in the right order. So can you explain this, this for our listeners? Yeah, just b b briefly, don't talk to management. Is, uh, I've, that's, I've revised that, do talk to management. It's a bad idea not to talk to management. They have so much insight and information, but do it in the right order. Don't put yourself in a situation where they're the first impression they make on you uh, so uh, that, that's a good segue into this idea of doing the research in the right order. So there's an idea that the first idea that comes into your head is the one that usually sticks the most, even if it's not the best idea. So, you know, people say first impressions count. First impressions do count because, because that's the way it seems that the brain works. And so if that's true, then we want to be really careful about how we take in information about a company, let's say. And so I'm trying to move as best I can from the most objective sources to the, to the least objective sources. So what I don't want to do is have a salesperson pitch me on something because I'm already, you know, once my brain has heard that, I can't unhear it. I can't unhear what I've, what I've heard and they'll put ideas into my head that maybe will kind of capture me with the attractiveness of the ideas. And I would tell you, Mary, that one of the things that's going to be really interesting as this period plays out is this concept of, so, so uh, Robert Schiller, uh, Nobel Prize winning Harvard economist has talked about narrative economics on a macro scale. But obviously many of these, many of the companies that we re research have a narrative and the narrative may not be the reality. And, and narratives are powerful because they take hold of us. And then we see everything in terms of that narrative. And, you know, I mean, Charles Dickens' great expectations. He had a narrative about what was going on, and then and then he discovers he had it completely wrong at the end. That can happen with a company, and so you don't want the narrative first. You want something that is as it will allow you to be as objective as possible. And for me, what's amazing about the public filings is that they're checked by lawyers. You know, they're, they're public statements. They have real consequences for the people who make them, and so that's really the best place to start if one possibly can. And I would say that it's not a it's not a all or nothing. So one can constantly order the information. I have three things on my desk. Look at the, you know, don't look at the thing that is a narrative type thing before I've looked at the, the something that is more in the direction of fundamental type stuff. And I think that, you know, uh, when you write, you need to tell a story and keep the reader interested and entertained. And therefore you have to remove a lot of what made the story. And 
Um, there's this concept in the Jewish world of the Sabbath is mountain ranges held up by threads. And I think that, you know, we're, we're, that, that this idea of getting the information in the right order is one of many threads that will hold up uh, somebody's investment returns, if you like. It's not going to be decisive. You can't just focus on that one thing, but you, you need as many of those things as you can, which are going to just lift your capacity to make better decisions just by a little bit. And hopefully if you do enough of them, you'll have just a little bit of an edge. Guy, you're a, you're a really thoughtful person. And this is a deep question. You talk a lot about the importance of non-financial matters, having hobbies. You talk about the compounding of goodwill and how much happiness that has brought to you. Give the example of, of writing people letters. And you close the book by saying that being the best version that you can be is the ultimate goal. I wondered why you've devoted your life to fund management, sort of profit maximising, and, and if you've ever questioned it, you know, sort of for our, lo lots of our listeners are younger and will be, will be at the start of their careers. The forces that drive us to make the decisions that we make are often ill understood for the majority of our lives. And I, I think I can give you an example of that from my life. So. When I graduated, when I finished my undergraduate degree at Oxford, I could have taken a, an academic path. I, I was offered a junior fellowship at uh, Brazenose. And I look back, and I did do, I did do this sort of All Souls Prize Fellowship exam, but I, I failed that miserably. And I didn't prepare for it either. But I really asked myself, because I think that I would have really, really enjoyed a, um, a an academic career. But I think, and this is, very specific to me uh um i am on one side of my family my my grandparents were german jews who had to get out of germany in a rush and some of them were wealthy industrialists and somehow one way or another what was transmitted to me that i was not aware at the time that i made these decisions was i had to kind of some kind of rebuild what was lost if you like and so that's why i kind of found a niche in the business world that allowed me to play with ideas and thoughts and you know i'm not very practical i'm not very good at organizing anything but the good news is is that in this world all i have to do is pick up the phone and call the broker so there's not that much in terms of execution if you like there are other worlds you run a retail operation execution is utterly critical but i think that so my answer to you and i hope it doesn't go too, too ethereal is that I think that we have to accept, I want to accept that there were patterns, there were things going on for me at the time that I made career choices that I don't even understand, but, but accept that and, and kind of make the most of it and uh, don't worry too much about it. Um, I think that something that to the extent that there are British listeners, I still think that the UK has a very, very long way to go in terms of I mean, in you know, some some American, famous American, whose name I can't remember, said the business of the United States is business, and uh, the business of the UK is not business. The business of the UK is all sorts of other things, and I think it should be more about business. Business is actually is a is is it, by many people considered, or well, in the Jewish world, is considered to be a highly moral activity. Uh, business is 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 the art of earning a living, paying your expenses. But it's also the art of making society better, society better in all sorts of practical ways. You get wealthy when you deliver more of what society wants. And, um, and so I think that all of business can be a highly honorable calling, far more honorable than it's considered to be in many parts of British society. Hopefully that's changing. And that doesn't mean that you need to be some kind of um, aggressive capitalist who's, uh, you know, you know, riding over the rights of the workers and sort of like keeping people down so that they can keep up and drink champagne and go to Ascot. It's kind of like, you know, maybe it's it's more in the direction, and now I cannot think of a British businessman who's like this. But, you know, there are businessmen like this. I can't think of anybody right now, but it's just somebody who lives a modest life, who has a, who ha whose calling is to deliver value to others in the ways that they can. No, Warren's done that, I think. I don't know. I've rambled a little bit, Mary. I apologize. And I got to cut it short because we got no time. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't apologize. Thank you so much for your time. That was fascinating. Thank you to everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts or leave a comment on YouTube. It will help the IC get more guests of Guy's Calibre. You can follow Guy on Twitter at G 
Spear and me on Twitter at Mary McDougall13. Thank you to everyone for listening.